Okay, nice to see you all today. I uh, hope you're having a good day so far. We're going to do two short Rashi's uh, from our Parsha. Here we go. Okay. Um, we're in the middle of the Midbar, and uh, the third Aliyah speaks about the encampment of the Jewish people and the Degalim, the flags that are going to uh, accompany each tribe. Every tribe is supposed to have its own flag, its own degel, and those degelim are not only important in terms of identifying the tribes, but also through the, uh, the designation of their tribes, as symbolized by their flag, they will encamp around the Oamoid, and that's the way that they'll travel through the desert. And then uh, the Torah goes on to describe who's on each side and how it all works and how it looks. I brought up this uh, little picture. There's a lot of interesting pictures here that come up when you Google encampment of the Jewish people in the desert. Um, I, I seem to remember finding some better pictures at some point, but this one is, is nice. You have the Mishkan in the middle, you have Gershon, Kahat, and Merari, the three uh, tribes of Levium around uh, the Mishkan. Which is like the first level. The first level of the camp is Hashem's camp. That's the Mishkan. The next level of the camp is Machna Levia. That's the camp of the Levium, as the buffer zone. And then on each side, you have three of the tribes amounting to twelve. So if you go through the Pesukim here in uh, Ar Aliyah, it tells you who's on each side, who's the lead tribe on each side, and then who follows them on each side. And there's a whole system and a whole logic and a whole philosophy to why you know, different tribes are grouped together and why they're in a certain place and why certain ones are in the back, so to speak, when they're traveling and so on and so forth. It's worth studying all the psukim here in our Aliyah, uh, but we're not going to do that today. Just the one interesting Rashi on the Tegalim, and then one interesting Rashi at the end uh, of our Aliyah. So it says here that the Degalim are Be'osos, that there's a sign to each Degel, Le'Beis Havosam, according to their father's households or according to their tribes. So what does Al Diglo Be'osos mean? So Rashi says, Kol Degel i Yelo Os Mapatz Vuatzlu Yabo. Every Degel, every flag would have a specific color to it, as you might know and as you might imagine. Sva Oshel Zeh, Lokitz Va Oshel Zeh. What the Torah is de designating here is that each should have an Os, the dis discernible, distinguishable sign from the other tribes. And the way to do that, the primary way to do that is through the colors. Every tribe's colored flag would match the color of its stone on the Choshen of the Kohen Gadol. And through the uh, color of their, of their flag, every tribe would recognize their space. Everyone would recognize their flag because of the color. So flags could serve certainly a... Um, a practical purpose, trying to gather the tribe around its flag. If you were walking through the desert with hundreds of thousands of people, you'd need something to follow to see that you were in the right place, that you were staying in the right encampment. So they obviously served a, a practical purpose, and it made sense that they would line up with their colors from the Choshen. However, I would imagine uh, there's so many different beautiful ideas about what the symbolism of the flag could be as well, aside from their practical purpose, just the idea of identifying with something, being able to hold up a banner that you're proud of, being able to associate with a group larger than yourselves. And of course, the whole balance here between individual and community and tribe and community and tribe and nation and how it all works in terms of the interplay of, of all those layers of identity that come to play. There's a beautiful uh, idea of them as Lyakov um, on this idea of the Degolim, which uh, perhaps we'll have time to share another time, but why it's specifically at this point in Jewish history that they become distinguished through Degolim as opposed to earlier. Uh, they could have, in theory, you know, had flags all the way since they left Egypt, and yet we find only now in Parshish Bemidbar uh, does Hashem designate flags for each of their tribes. So that's how uh, the, the flags come to play. Rashi ends in a very interesting way. He says, he says, from here, this prime example in the Torah, kings later in Jewish history learned to have their coat of arms, learned to have their flag, their distinguishing signs uh, to show that they were different from everybody else and uh, to be able to mark them and to be able to recognize them. So whether or not the flags of kings or the coat of arms of royal families uh, emanated from the flags of the tribes or not, I'm not sure, but it's an interesting association and certainly a nice extrapolation from the idea of having a flag uh, to the idea that other important people like kings would want to be identified by their flag as well and distinguished by it in terms of their distinction from the rest of the world. Um, fast forwarding all the way to the end of uh, near the end of our Aliyah, after all of the tribes are told where they're supposed to go, 
it says over here, uh, let's go to the Rashi as well. Um, the Olamoed travels in the middle with the Machana Levia surrounding it. And Kasher Yachanu Keni Sao. The way that they encamped is the way they should travel. So just like it looks now in the picture that I showed you, just as they would be encamped that way, they would travel in that way as well with the Mishkan in the middle and all the tribes with their flags, Al Yado, on their side. So there's an interesting linguistic Rashi here. We had a, a nice Hashkafic Rashi about the Degolim, but now an interesting linguistic Rashi to end this Aliyah. When you say Al Yado uh, in Hebrew, Al Yad, even in modern Hebrew, it means next to. And that's, I think, what it means here in the Pasuk as well. It means that every tribe was next to the Mishkan, adjacent to, al yado. Even look at the translation here. Let's see what it says. Um, as they encamp, so they should, they should have every man in his place by their standards. Okay, by is al yado. Um, I guess that means that over here. Uh, it's maybe not a great translation. Al Yado, just in general, means Al Yad, next to. But Rashi tells us why Al Yad, why is in Hebrew, next to is Al Yad. He says, Al Yad is Al Mekomo in their place. Yad zaz but it's not like a different understanding of the word Yad. It actually fits Al Yado, next to, or adjacent to, or on its place, fits with the meaning of Yad itself. Ruach shall tzad he al yado. Smucha lo lechohash hoshat as yadav. He says the idea of being next to something means you're in hand's reach. So al yad, next to the hand, means that you're close enough to be next to it, which is why in Hebrew al yad means next to, because there's only a certain span that your hands can reach out. It's only in the area immediately next to you. So when you want to refer to next to something or adjacent to something, you'd say al yad, next to the hand, because the hand only reaches so far. It's a beautiful uh, understanding. I never realized that about the expression in Hebrew. I thought uh, that was kind of cool. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.